So I just want to raise your faith as we start tonight. Raise your faith. We're talking about deliverance. We're talking about demonic doorways. The devil is not online with Jesus. It's not an even battle. He's already been defeated. He knows he's been defeated. You know, Pastor Archer says we're going to give the devil a bloody nose tonight. Well, I think every time we talk about deliverance, we're giving the devil a bloody nose, right? And so um, God's going to do some great things. Just open up your heart. It's tough stuff that you're going to hear. Um, but open up your heart to receive because if you truly receive it, it's where God can really do the work in your life. Amen? Amen. 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 So I'll just invite Sarah up to the stage. And I wasn't planning on doing this earlier, but I'm just going to anoint her right in front of all of you. Because I don't think you realize the battle. When you preach deliverance, and most places don't want to preach deliverance, the first week that she spoke, you could literally hear the thing the spirits coming against our house on the outside you can literally hear the house sh feel the house shake but how many know they can't come in the house <laughs> right so we're going to anoint sarah so just stretch your hands out to her father we we anoint sarah with the with the oil father we ask lord that you would fill her with your holy spirit lord from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet Lord, I pray that every word that is spoken tonight would be of you. Father, I pray that you would quicken her mind. And Father, where her voice has been weak this week because of sickness, Lord, Father, we just rebuke any sickness out of her body. Lord, we rebuke any sore throat or any sore chest. Father, we command it to leave her body in the name of Jesus Christ. By your stripes, we are healed. And you're the, you're the same God that came to heal all of our sicknesses and all of our diseases. And so, Father, we claim the blood of Jesus over Sarah tonight, Father. Thank you for the word that's coming tonight. And we praise you and we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, Sarah, tonight, everybody. Hello. Thank you, Philly. Yeah, I'm going to need some grace tonight because my voice is being weak. I've being hit on Tuesday, got hit really bad, and then um, all day today, I've been clearing my throat. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just asked for some grace. Um, and, Lord, I need your help tonight. So I ask that you'll help me. Let it be your words that come out of my mouth, Father. In the name of Jesus. Okay. Um... I'm just going to rebuke the demons right now that are going to try to distract you, disrupt you, make you sleepy, um, keep you from deliverance and hinder your deliverance. I rebuke and bind you, Satan, and you demons in Jesus' name, and I command you to be quiet, and you will not be able to distract these people or anyone watching online in the power in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. I forgot to do that last week, so... <laughs> Better do it tonight. Okay, so last week um, we started getting into the doorways. We talked about whether a Christian can have a demon or not. And there's a lot of information on doorways. I'm finding this out as I'm going. I've known it for a while, but when you're trying to put something together, it, it's a lot. <laughs> and I don't want to miss anything that's really important that you guys might need to hear. Um, so we're going to continue with doorways today. Um, and then we'll finish off the doorways next week. So there's a lot of doorways. Um, but I'm kind of going to, like we just finished talking about New Age doorways and occultic and witchcraft doorways. But I want to stop, before we move on to the next doorways, I want to stop and kind of give you a little bit of information on how Christians and churches have unknowingly <coughs> participated in witchcraft and, mm -hmm. and um, New Age. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the importance of severing between the soul and the spirit. Um, so, if you weren't here last week or the week before, I really recommend you go watch online. Um, you're really going to need that information to understand as we keep going through. So, I really recommend that. Um, and last week, I did forget to mention a few of the New Age doorways. I'm just going to say them really quick. And you guys can go look into it yourself if you want to. But um, biofeedback is one of them that I forgot to mention. Alpha brain wave control, um, uh, holistic medicine, 
um, well, I don't know how to say this, but homopathy, <laughs> homeopathy, um, those kind of things. I'm not saying it's all bad, but it, you just be very careful and ask the Lord to show you. That's all I ask, that you just ask the Lord to give you wisdom when you're getting into that kind of stuff. Um, and I just want you to be aware of it, okay? Um, so as I mentioned last week, same thing. This section is going to be very difficult to hear, especially when we're talking about how Christians can unknowingly participate in these things. Um, but I'm telling you them because it's so important to be aware, be alert. The Bible tells us to know the schemes of the devil, not just know them, but be familiar with them. And so that's why I'm talking about them so much. And uh, the next story where we're going to go through is the generational inherited doorways tonight. So <clears throat> that's going to happen next. But as I said, I'm going to talk about Christian churches. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Christian churches have been deceived into disregarding the sober warnings given through scripture. That Satan will work in our time through false teachings, false miracles, false words of knowledge, false prophecies, and false manifestations of godliness. They blindly follow leaders because of their charisma and accept everything they say. <clears throat> they assume that because they speak about the Lord and look and act like servants of God, that they are servants of God. Very few people ever stop to evaluate what a pastor says or search out the scriptures for themselves. And we expect you all to do that with everything we say, with, with everything Sean preaches. <clears throat> it's very important. It's a terrible mistake to assume that any time anyone uses the word Lord or Christ or even Jesus, that they are referring to the God and Jesus of the Bible. And I can't emphasize this enough. We need to continually be on our faces before the Lord, asking him to reveal Satan's deceptions to us. This is so important. <clears throat> we need to be studying God's word and prayerfully check out every teaching that you put yourself under. There will always be areas of disagreement in any church, any book you read, but we must be alert for doctrines or practices that can open us up to demonic um, influences and distract us from Jesus Christ. And that's really what they're meant to do, is to distract us. We're living in evil times, right? <laughs> We must understand that false spirits are in all Christian churches. Yep. It's everywhere. Especially the ones that preach truth. <laughs> because Satan's trying to bring them down. <laughs> I want to make it clear, though, that I'm not criticizing any particular doctrine. I'm not criticizing any churches, okay? I just want you guys to be aware. Um, and I want to point out some common practices that are found within many of these churches. And discuss the dangers of them. Good. So what are some of these teachings? <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a type of witchcraft called white witchcraft, and it sometimes involves the reciting of a psalm or certain Bible verses, usually in repetition, over and over again, while using the combination of oil and salt. Salt is used in a number of occultic rituals. It's never used in biblical practices, in actual anointing, or things it's right. it's a symbol right. it, it talks about us being the salt right. of the earth but it's never used in yeah. in any sort of um, yeah. you know anointing or practice yeah. um, so we just need to be really aware of that okay there's a dangerous teaching in some charismatic churches where members are told to repeat certain repeat certain phrases over and over or to blank out their minds and let the Holy Spirit take over this is especially done in an effort to get some to speak in tongues. So we talked about the blanking out of the mind last week, right? And the dangers of that and how we're never, ever supposed to blank out our mind. That's not biblical whatsoever. And a lot of people that do this, they might be taken over by a spirit, all right. But that's not the Holy Spirit. That's an unholy spirit. Um, and so this is why we have to be so careful about that. Another area of witchcraft that Christians unknowingly use is the area of herbs. Um, and again, this is a touchy one. I'm not saying herbs are bad. Herbs, God created herbs, right? <laughs> but 
The truth is that a lot of herbalists and herb shop owners are involved in witchcraft and incantations have been done over many of those herbs. So again, I'm not saying don't take herbs or don't do any of that stuff. Just really seek the Lord and ask him to give you wisdom on it um, because we don't want to be taking something that has some sort of incantation or curse cast on it, right? <laughs> um, and God has given us herbs that have various medicinal qualities, right? So we need to remember that and use what he's given us, but just be careful. If you can, grow your own. <laughs> yeah. That's probably the, the best way to know for sure that they're not, they don't have anything on it, but just be careful. And the same is true, true for health food stores. Um, a lot of those stores are owned by Hindu gurus, and the same thing, they do prayers of blessing over a lot of their products. So just be careful, excuse me. Diet is a large part of this movement, especially vegetarianism. Um, and I'm gonna go later into the importance of eating protein. I believe, sorry, I hope I don't offend anyone here, but I believe that vegetarianism is purely demonic, yeah. demonic to the core. There's a reason why after the flood, God specifically told Noah to eat lots of protein. Remember that before the flood, there was the Nephilim. There was literal demonic junk going on everywhere. Um, and the Lord knew that Satan would try to do that again. There's an important protein. You need that to be able to fight spiritual warfare. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but <laughs> I'm gonna go into a bit, bit of that later. Um, but yeah, a lot of the herbalist health food stores, um, they teach to maintain a strict vegetarian diet, all that stuff. So just be really, really weary, really or uh, leery of that. Um, remember that any supernatural healing, other than which comes from Jesus Christ Himself, is a demonic healing and results in demonic infestation. It's just the truth. Okay, so this is this is a really important one, and this is what I wanted to get to. I could have talked about it last week, um, but. I'm talking about it tonight because it is an, an area that a lot of Christians participate in, and it's visualization. Um, this is a trap that a lot of Christians fall into, and they can open demonic doorways. The Christian can be completely unaware of what is happening and think that he is operating in the Holy Spirit, when in fact he is communicating with an unholy spirit. And I want to show you by God's word just how dangerous this practice is. But first, let's define some of the teachings. Visualization is the creation of an image or picture in the mind through imagination. People are taught that they can have tremendous power to alter their life, bring about healing in their physical bodies or the bodies of others, bring about emotional healings, achieve wealth and success, all through the use of visual visualization. So how does this work? Well, people are told, that they must visualize, vi visualize <laughs> an image or picture of whatever it is they want. As they frequently recreate or visualize, <laughs> I can't say this word, um, the same picture over and over, this releases the power to bring the vision into existence in their life. For example, if they have a tumor in their liver, they must visualize their liver and the tumor and then the tumor visualize it shrinking until it actually vanish, vanishes altogether. They spend time every day reproducing this picture of events over and over in their minds until the tumor is actually gone. There was an interesting case on a TV talk show regarding the technique of visualization. A man was on the show who had a tumor in his brain which was inoperable. His family told him to spend time every day visualizing the tumor and then visualizing the little men coming to destroy it. Little men <laughs> coming to destroy it. And then visualize the tumor shrinking down to nothing. And he did this faithfully for many days. Finally, he reached the point where he could not see the tumor anymore. Not physically see it, but see it in his spirit. There was just a small white, white spot is what he could see. At that point, it was time for a checkup. He had another special x-ray of his brain, and much to the doctor's amazement, the tumor had disappeared. 
In its place was a small calcified area which showed up as a small white spot on the x-ray. Millions are using these techniques and they are being quite successful actually. Why is this? Because visualization or the creation of images occurs in the spirit. As people repeatedly create these images in their conscious awareness, they are establishing contact with their spirits. So they're learning how to become in control of their own spirit. So basically, yeah, I just said that. They're learning to control their own spirit bodies. And their spirits then affect the changes they want in their physical body. This is the same healing power used by those involved in Eastern religions and the occult. In the case of the man who visualized little men destroying his brain tumor, the healing received was actually a demonic healing. The link he established with his spirit is clearly demonstrated by the fact that he was able to actually see the white calcified area that was left after the tumor was destroyed. His physical eyes couldn't see it, but his, the eyes of his spirit could. The technique of visualization to affect physical healing has been used all throughout history in demonic religions. Another example is in the book titled The Secret. This book is based on the law of attraction. The author claims that we think and feel, as we think and feel, a corresponding frequency is sent out to the universe that attracts back to us events and circumstances on that same frequency. For example, if you think angry thoughts and feel angry, it is claimed that you will attract back and the circumstances that cause you to feel more anger. Or if you think and feel positively, you will attract back positive events and circumstances. Teachers of this law claim that simply changing one's thoughts and feelings can attract desirable outcomes such as health, wealth, and happiness. So this is pure deception. I'm gonna tell you why. Um, the devil counterfeits the kingdom of Jesus Christ and creates false healings by first afflicting the person with a disease and then removing it. He afflicts the person with the disease for a season and then stops afflicting them for another season. And this person goes back to normal and calls this a healing, but it's not a healing at all. We have seen it, Sean and I have seen this many times. <laughs> I'm healed, I'm healed. And then yeah. two or three months later, no, <laughs> it comes back. Yeah. Um, so what's the purpose of this? This keeps them in demonic bondage with the enemy and he now has legal rights to continue afflicting this person whenever he wants. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. So it's true that our tongue does have power, yeah. right? Yeah. Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Okay. Verse, okay. <laughs> the Bible says to speak life. The enemy uses the counterfeit by using the law of attraction to bring death. This is a counterfeit light, like kind of like good karma or bad karma, right. which yeah. is demonic. Now, if something good, such as physical healing, can result through Christians' use of control of their spirit, then why would it be wrong? And this is the sole purpose why it's wrong. Because the practice of visualization puts the Christian into contact with the spirit world via his own spirit, under the control of his own will, not under the will of God. So that's a big statement there. Therefore, the link developed between the soul and spirit is a sinful one, and it's demonically controlled. Hebrews 4 verse 12 talks about this, the necessity to sever the link between the soul and the spirit. Right. Hebrews 4 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Right. We cannot have a severing between our soul and spirit spoken of in this verse and still remain in control of our spirits. Right. It's not possible. Right. Yep. God's word equates this use of visualization 
generated by our own wills with witchcraft. This is witchcraft when we try to use our spirits to do something. There are leading Christian pastors who teach the use of visualization. And one of them makes a remark in one of his books that the language of the spirit is images and visions. This is actually true. I'll show you why. Um, scripture shows us this in Ezekiel. Ezekiel tells of, us of, us of an incident which shows the relationship between visions and the spirit world. In Ezekiel 8, verse 2 to 3, it says, Then I looked, and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire, from the appearance his waist and downward, fire, and from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem. Here Ezekiel describes the communication he received through the Spirit. The communication was in the form of a vision or visualized uh, pictures. But please note, he clearly states that these visions were of God. He did not willfully form the pictures himself to create some sort of thing that he wanted out of his own will. Okay? Ezekiel 11 verse 24 says, Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. Again, in this scripture, Ezekiel shows us that the communication from the spirit world was in the form of visions and that the visions were from God. Because God himself is spirit, he communicates with us through our spirits. So that statement that that guy made in one of his book, books was actually true. But, but as we go on, we'll find out why we shouldn't be doing it in our own will. Um, Jeremiah 14, verse 13 to 15 says, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. This is what the prop, these were false prophets <laughs> that were saying this to them. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoke to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. This is where it talks about, this is divination, which is witchcraft. So this is, they were participating in witchcraft. <laughs> Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say sword and famine will not be in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets will be consumed. That's scary. So these scriptures show a progression. First, the prophets made a mistake in their visions. Therefore, they were unable to judge correctly and did not walk according to God's will. Second, the prophet spoke from a vision that they had created. They created this in their own minds. Note the scripture says they speak of a vision of their own heart, not out of the mouth of the Lord. This is condemned by God. Thirdly, these people who accepted the teaching of these false visions were willing to do so because they themselves were following after their own visions. They didn't want to hear the bad things, just the good things. Doesn't that sound like today? Yeah. Don't tell us those bad things. We just want to hear, you know, all the great stuff that's gonna, that the Lord is going to do. <laughs> yeah, make me feel good. That's all people want to hear. Um, they said, no evil will come upon you, right? False vision. That surely did not happen. <laughs> Jeremiah they hated him so much for speaking the truth and speaking things that they did not want to hear that they threw, they, they, so I think it was like a deep old well or something that they threw him into and he was there for a long time. Yeah. They hated him because yeah. he was speaking the truth. So people are being told to visualize healing, health, wealth, success, whatever they want, but not what God wants necessarily. Yeah. Now I'm not saying God doesn't want healing and health and all those things for you, okay? <laughs> But they're totally unwilling to accept that sometimes we suffer. Oh, God allows us to suffer. Oh, God never wants us to suffer. That's not even biblical. 
there are multiple verses that talk about suffering for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and persecution. So that's a false doc. That's just false gospel being preached right there alone. Um, so lastly, in verse 14 of that scripture, I just read, it's very clear that people are using visions from their own will. Um, out of their own will, they got entangled in the spirit world. And this is the whole purpose I'm talking about. This is the spirit world. God equated these false visions with divination, which is witchcraft. And any time humans are in contact with the spirit world outside the will of God, they are in contact with unholy spirits or demons, right. not the Holy Spirit. Um, and we got to remember, like, some people might think, well, how can this be? It seems so good. These things that, you know, yeah. seem so good. But remember that Satan portrays himself as an angel of light. Right. Right. He doesn't come looking scary with the, you know, pitchfork and the <laughs> pointy tail. He, he portrays himself as an angel sometimes. Yeah, right. And this is why we have to be so careful. Yeah. A link forged between the soul and the spirit out of the will of the person is always or out of the will of the person, so their person's own will, is always a demonic link because it's forged in sin. How the deception spreads. The more people use visualization, the more skilled they become at using their spirits, and the more contact they gain with demons. These people have countless revelations and interpretations of God's word, which they accept as being from the Holy Spirit because it obviously comes from a spiritual realm, what they don't realize is that everything they're receiving is from unholy spirits because the link between their souls and spirits are demonic links. And so here are some symptoms which occur when there is a link between the soul and spirit. Okay? Frequent visions or communication from the spirit world. The ability to control when a person will receive a vision or communication from, a spirit, from the spirit world. The ability to see auras. Auras are like various types of colors of light that some people see around people or things. The ability to see demons frequently, or sometimes they don't think they're demons, sometimes they're angels. Oh, I see angels all the time. I talk to angels all the time. They're demons. Trust me when I tell you they are demons. <laughs> and I'll, I'll prove it in a little bit. Um, the ability to see spirits in a mirror or changes of reflection in a mirror. The ability to astral project or have out-of-body experiences, levitation, and many more. This is, that, those are the things, are things that people that use their spirit, their own spirits, out of the will of God are doing. So I'm now going to talk about the importance of severing between soul and spirit. Um... Communication with the spirit world other than the rare occasions where the Lord allows it is very dangerous. And yes, the Lord has allowed some communication through the spirit world throughout the word of God. If you look at the Bible, he used a few people that he allowed to see into the spirit world, such as John. When he wrote the book of Revelation, he had this experience. Daniel had this experience. He had multiple visions. Um... And there are others as well in the Bible. But this is not something the Lord allowed them to have frequently, like on a daily basis type of thing. If you look at Daniel's visions, he was always either extremely sick or completely exhausted afterwards. There's a reason for that. <laughs> it's not something that, that the Lord bent for us to do on a regular basis. When Mary, um, uh, when the angel visited her to tell her she was going to have G baby Jesus, that was not like something that she experienced all the time. That was like a one or two, same with Joseph and, and Zechariah, one or two time thing. It was not something that was a frequent daily thing. So if I hear people tell me, oh, I talk to angels and I see visions and all this kind of stuff on a regular frequent basis, I am telling you it is demonic. And that link has to be severed in the name of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The whole purpose of severing between the soul and spirit mentioned in Hebrews 4.12 is to separate our spirit from the influence of any of our natural selfish desires which reside in our souls. This is why we shouldn't have use of our spirits on our own, outside of the will of God. 
<clears throat> if a Christian walks in submission to God, he will not originate anything. Instead, he will wait quietly for the voice of the Holy Spirit to be heard in his spirit and then act only according to the directions of the Holy Spirit. And this is why it's so important to distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit or our own thoughts or demonic thoughts. Yeah. Sean talked about that not too long ago. A Christian who is in conscious contact with his own spirit will not wait in, sub in submission for the Holy Spirit to speak to him. He will be taking the initiative, and so the voice he hears in his spirit will most likely not be that of the Holy Spirit. If we have opened a doorway to Satan in this area, he can use the person's spirit body without the person ever being aware. And I'll give you an example of how Satan can use your spirit body if you allow him, give him access. Um, hatred. 1 John 3 verse 15 says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. How can we be a murderer through the emotion of hatred? <laughs> emotion how can we murder someone hatred is a conscious sin and it gives satan legal ground in our lives if we permit it to dwell in our hearts if you hate someone and i'm going to be talking about unforgiveness unforgiveness and hatred because that is a doorway um, i'll be talking about that later but if you hate someone satan can step in and use your spirit body to attack the person you hate that's serious you don't even know he's doing it the person that's getting attacked doesn't know that Satan's using your spot, spirit body to attack them. Um, <clears throat> and these attacks can produce all sorts of illness. It can produce accidents, like weird, strange accidents. It can produce emotional problems and even sometimes physical death. This is why we must be so careful to ask Jesus to cleanse and keep pure our body, soul, and spirit. Yeah, yeah. And that is also why Jesus gave us the commands to forgive. This is multiple times in his word. Forgive, 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 70 times seven. There's, there's a reason for that. He didn't just say it. There's a reason for it. Forgiveness puts a stop to hatred. Um, there's one more area of visualization that needs to be mentioned. And I'm just going to say this real briefly. Pastors are teaching people to visualize Jesus Christ. To build a picture of what they think Jesus looks like in their minds. To speak out that vision and then always pray to that Jesus. This is supposed to activate faith. But scripture defines faith as the following. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The clear statement is made in 2 Corinthians verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Why then the tremendous emphasis on sight or visualization in these days? Why? Second yeah. Corinthians. I believe this is a serious doctrine of demons placed within Christian churches to bring God's people, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring God's people into a deceptive relationship with demons. The whole doctrine of visualization is this, rebellion against God's will when he doesn't give us what we want. That's the truth. Okay, moving on. Do you repeat that? Yep. Yeah, um, the whole doctrine of visualization is this. Rebellion against God's will when he doesn't give us what we want. Wow. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about releasing of spirits. This is another area of witchcraft in which Christians become involved in. In many churches, people are taught to release spirits of revelation, peace, and love. This doesn't sound like anything bad, does it? Um, but revelation is not a spirit. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Love, peace, joy, those are not spirits. They are um, they're fruits of the Spirit. So they're not spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. 
And the other spirits are demons or angels or human spirits, okay? So when we release spirits of love and that kind of thing, we're actually releasing demonic spirits on someone. And, and it sounds great. Oh, well, how can a demon be a spirit of love? Well, it can be a spirit of false love. <laughs> or, or they twist things, Satan. Copycats, remember? Um, <clears throat> white, witches, white witches and new agers release such spirits all the time. Just ask anyone that has previously been involved in Satanism. They are taught to do this in churches. You never want to put a spirit on anyone. Okay. Also, many churches teach prayers of sending witchcraft curses back onto the sender. Christians don't send demons onto anyone. That's practicing witchcraft. That's what witches do. <laughs> okay? So don't do that. <laughs> They'll say, oh, I sent that curse back sevenfold. No, nope, don't do that. Because <laughs> you're sending seven times the demons onto someone. That's practicing witchcraft. Don't do it. It's not a, that's not a testimony, right? Luke 6, verse 28, and this is Jesus speaking, says, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. We don't curse them. Another area is laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is widely practiced in many Christian churches, and this is a biblical practice. Um, this basic scriptural foundation is found in many places in the New Testament. And I'll just list off a few real quick. James 5, verse 14 to 16. Acts 9, verse 17. Acts 14, verse 3. Acts 28, verse 8. Hebrews 6, verse 1 to 2. I mean, there's many instances that talks about that. And I'm not going to read them all because we don't have time. But it is biblical. But there is one much overlooked scripture in all of this. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in another person's sins. Keep yourself pure. Amen. So I just want to warn you, be very careful both in who you permit to lay their hands on you and who you lay your hands on. If you subject yourself to someone whom you don't really know, you can directly open yourself up to a transfer of demons. This is a tactic used by Satanists within charismatic churches frequently. People that profess to be Christians, but aren't. Remember, Satan tries to mimic everything God does, and Satan and his demons can work miracles. They can. Matthew 24, verse 24, verse 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The laying on of hands is commonly practiced in occultic rituals in order to transfer demons, okay? This is used frequently in that world. So I'm not saying go on a witch hunt. <laughs> um, I'm just saying be alert. Test the spirits. Be careful who you um, let lay hands on you. Put the armor on daily, okay? Um, and. You know, this is an area where we have made a mistake in, in the past. You know, we, this is now why we have a team of people at the front instead of just anyone coming to the front and praying. We don't know a lot of people that come to the front. We don't know what kind of spirit is on them. So we have to be careful as people that we know and trust. So I'm going to give you an example of how dangerous this can be. Um, this is from the book Prepare for War by Dr. Rebecca Brown. I'm just going to read it real quick. Leah is a woman in her 30s. 16 years ago, she was a prostitute and a heroin addict in Los Angeles. One night, someone stopped her on the street, handed her a tract, and presented the gospel to her. She was so convicted that she went back to her room and fell on her knees and wept. She repented of her sins and asked Jesus to forgive and cleanse her. She spent the next, next hour coughing up the most horrible stuff she had ever seen. She knew she was demon-possessed and realized that the Lord was driving all the demons out of her. Praise the Lord. She stopped heroin cold turkey. And if any of you know how difficult that would be, it has to be only from being delivered that she could do that. Um, and never had a withdrawal symptom. That's pretty amazing. 
The next morning, Leah went out and bought a Bible. She spent the next three months reading God's word. She obtained and kept a steady job for the first time in her life. Within four months after making Jesus her Lord and Savior, she was back out on the streets again. Only this time, she was leading the pimps and prostitutes to the Lord. Her entire life had changed, and her joy was reading God's word and praying and doing his work. About ten months after her conversion, as Leah was looking around for a church, she read into or she um, met a woman who claimed to be a Christian. This lady asked her if she had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Leah did not know what this was, but wanting everything the Lord wanted to give her, she listened to the woman. The woman took her to her house and laid hands on her, trying to get her to speak in tongues. Leah couldn't and was overwhelmed with guilt because the woman told her she was grieving the Holy Spirit. The woman accused Leah of refusing to let the Lord speak through her in tongues. Then she told Leah to come to church with her the following night. A special guest speaker was in town, and Leah was told that after the service, he would lay his hands on her, and she would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and would speak in tongues. Leah... Um, did know from her intensive study of the Bible that something like this had occurred in Samaria, um, which is in Acts chapter 8. And I'm not, for sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But if you do read it, you'll note that it does not mention specifically that the people spoke in tongues when they, were, when they had hands laid on them and prayed for. Um, and also, Leah didn't know how to test the spirits mentioned in 1 John 4. So Leah went to church the church service that night with great expectations. After the service, she went forward, knelt down, and the man ministering that night laid his hands on her and prayed. Leah said that as he prayed, she felt as if a ball of fire struck her in her stomach with such a force that she was thrown backwards onto her back and on the floor. The fire spread up into her chest and immediately she started speaking in tongues. Everyone rejoiced, saying that she had received the Holy Spirit. However, the following years were to prove that Leah had received an unholy spirit. Trouble started almost immediately. She had continual stomach and intestinal problems, which the doctors could never diagnose nor cure. She began having difficult hearing from the Lord, reading her Bible. That is a main sign that you have open doorways or that you have... um, something demonic going on in your life. If you can't read the Bible clearly, there's a doorway. By the time I met her, this is the lady that wrote the book, she was completely unable to maintain a clear mind long enough to read the Bible more than a minute or two at a time. The only way she she could pray was in tongues. And she was very ill, discouraged, and depressed. I realized that Leah most likely had a demon of false tongues. I asked her if she could speak in tongues anytime she wanted to, and she said yes. So I asked her to start speaking in tongues and keep speaking in tongues regardless of what I said. As Leah started speaking in tongues, I said the following words. You spirit speaking through Leah in tongues, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I command you to tell me what do you have to say about Jesus and which Jesus do you serve? Mm. Leah was horrified when cursing started coming out of her mouth. She clapped her hand over her mouth to stop the flow of words. The spirit speaking in tongues had flunked the test. He was quite obviously a demon. Leah had allowed a man whom she did not know lay hands on her, and then she had accepted what had happened to her without testing the spirit she had received. She suffered for 16 years because of this. You may ask, How could a demon of false tongues have gotten into Leah since she was a Christian? Wasn't she protected? The answer is no, because she disobeyed God's commands given in the Bible. She subjected herself to a person whom she didn't know, accepting whatever it is that he chose to give her. Secondly, she again violated God's word by not testing the spirit she received to be sure that it was the Holy Spirit. So this is as simple as it is to get rid of this spirit. She simply asked the Lord to forgive her for not completely following his word. Then she spoke out loud and commanded the demon of false tongues to leave her in the name of Jesus. 
Her stomach and intestinal problems were immediately healed. I heard from her again six months after she had kicked out the demon and she joyfully told me that she, she could again read the Bible free from interference and her relationship with the Lord was closer than it had ever been. She could pray freely and joyfully. So I tell you this story not to make you paranoid or not able to trust anyone, okay? I'm just saying we need to know the importance of why we need to test the spirits. Be very careful about this. And many times we're tempted to allow someone to pray for us because we don't, or to put their hands on us because we don't want to offend them. <laughs> um, but hear this, a true servant of God will not be insulted if you test them. Um, false servants get very angry. <laughs> and humility is the mark of a true servant of God, okay? Just remember that. Um, okay, so that was a story about false tongues, but now I'm going to actually get into false tongues. <laughs> Not all tongues are from the Holy Spirit, as you just saw. <laughs> um, it is well known that many occultic rituals are done in tongues. People involved in many forms of Eastern meditation are, speak in tongues. A very large number of Christians falling under peer pressure simply memorize several phrases which they repeat over and over again in various combinations thinking that they're speaking in tongues the holy spirit gives his gifts as he wills it not as we will Amen. as we want okay um i have not found anywhere in scripture that it says that every christian receives that gift 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11 says, the, There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences in ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the work, working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Okay? First Corinthians 14 Verse 27 and 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. So disobedience to the scripture has opened up church churches to a massive inflow of demonic influences. Yep. Satanists can easily speak in tongues yep. directly from demons. Yep. They place curses upon the, upon the church, the pastor, and the people without anyone knowing that is what they are doing because there is no interpretation and no testing of the spirits. The Holy Spirit operates in a mighty way and he gives gifts as he wills to the people. So I'm gonna share a little testimony um, of my own personal experience with this. Um, I had never been able to speak in tongues and about eight years ago, the church we were in were doing a series on the Holy Spirit. And after every single service, they would you know, anyone that wanted the gift of the Holy Spirit to come forward, people would pray for you. And <clears throat> so I desperately wanted this gift. I couldn't understand why I didn't have it yet. And it was actually very humbling me for, for me to go to the front because here I am, a pastor's wife in a church that believed at that time, I don't know if they believe it anymore, but at the time they believed that if you were a Christian, you would have the gift of speaking in tongues. <laughs> So that was a very, and I don't didn't like going up to the front anyway. So <laughs> that alone, plus, you know, here I am a pastor's wife, can't speak in tongues. Um, so this had, going up meant I had to admit that I didn't have that gift. Um, so I went up and one of the leaders prayed for me. Nothing happened. Prayed for me various times. Nothing happened. I felt the pressure more and more that I had to do this. And he said to me, just open your mouth and whatever comes out, just speak it. 
Well, I opened my mouth and a bunch of gibberish came out. I sounded like a complete idiot. <laughs> um, and I struggled so much because I felt such a pressure to do this. And I begged God to give it to me. And I was like, what is wrong with me? And then I had a nice chat with my dad. Bless my dad. Um, he told me how he too had wanted the gift of tongues. He was a pastor of a church. He would ask the Lord, please, I want this gift. And for years, years went by and he didn't get it. Um, and then one morning he was, my dad has a regular habit of every morning, six o'clock or something like crazy early like that, he would get down on his hands and knees and pray. And one morning he wasn't even asking for it. He wasn't even thinking about it. The Holy Spirit just gave him the gift. And he said to me, Sarah, the Holy Spirit does not give you the tongues when you want. Or he might not give them to you at all. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> it is, a, he will give you the gifts that he wants, when he wants, and how he wants. It is completely up to him and out of your will, but his will. Yeah. He said, rest in that. Don't obsess over it. And I actually felt a huge weight lifted off my shoulders after that. It, it just, it was so freeing to know, okay, this isn't in my control. I don't get to go and demand to the Lord what he gives me. He'll give me the gifts that he knows that I need at the right time when he wants. And here's the truth. I still don't have that gift, but I know the Holy Spirit is in me and I have multiple other gifts that he has given me. Um, so have peace knowing that. <laughs> don't ever let someone tell you that you have to have certain gifts or certain abilities if you're not, you're not saved. Yeah. Don't trust that. Yeah. His will be done in your life yeah. at the right time. Right. Yeah. Um, if you think you possibly might have the gift of false tongues, or you might even not be sure, you can pray a prayer, prayer something like this. Father, I want to serve you in purity and in truth. If the tongues I received are truly from the Holy Spirit, then I thank you for it. But if they are not, I reject and renounce them in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, and ask you to take them away. I ask you and thank you for this in Jesus' name. And then you can just command, say, demon of false tongues, leave me now in the name of Jesus. That's all you need to do. Okay? Next one I'm going to do is false signs and wonders. Um, there is a romance going on between Christians and signs and wonders. <laughs> Miracles. A very large percentage of Christians seek after nothing but miracles. Somehow they have this idea that they should sail through life with no troubles, commanding God to work miracle after miracle to satisfy their every want. Jesus directly addressed such an attitude while he was here on earth. Matthew chapter 16 verse 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. A wicked and adulterous generation certainly describes the current state of our world. <laughs> Too many seek only for relief from their problems rather than for God's will in their lives. We must be careful that our desire to, for ease and relief from pain or whatever it might be does not lead us into accepting miracles from the wrong source. Let's look at Matthew 24, verse 24, one more time. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Yeah. Not every sign and wonder is of the Lord. Right. <clears throat> and we most definitely do serve a miracle working God, okay? Like, we have personally seen more miracles than we can even count. You've heard Sean's testimonies of, of um, you know, when he'd go to the hospital and pray, pray for people. We have seen so many things. But too many Christians simply assume that all miracles are from God. The scriptures are clear. Demons can heal. We saw that in one of the other scriptures I read. They can produce false manifestations of every work of the Holy Spirit, and they are working mightily in this way in these last days. So how are we to sort out which of the miracles are real and which are false? Often the only way is to ask the Lord directly to give us guidance, but there are a few keys um, that we can look for. The first one is, are the healings performed whenever the person with the supposed gift chooses? 
God heals only when he chooses, not when we choose. You might say, oh, well, Jesus and his disciples healed every time. There is biblical proof that that actually isn't the case, and I don't have time to get into it tonight, but if you want more information on that, I will give you the verses, okay? Um, number two, do miracles take place in such a manner as to bring attention to the person through whom they are worked? The Holy Spirit has one goal in mind, to bring glory to Jesus Christ. He never works in a way to bring glory to a human. Never. Number three, what is the long-term result of the miracle or healing? Is the person drawn closer to the Lord, demonstrated by obedience to God's commands and a hunger after God's word? Or do they simply rejoice briefly and then go on with their life as usual? Each time a miracle is recorded in Acts, the people rejoiced and served the Lord as a result. Many Christians open themselves up to demons through lusting for miracles. Ministers who are constantly teaching signs and wonders fall into error by teaching that God always wants to do such signs and they get into the trap of having to make God perform then. Then there's a pressure on them. And then if it doesn't work, then they'll say, oh, you must have a lack of faith or you must have some sin in your life. Mm -mm. When Jesus would heal people in the Bible, he didn't say to them, oh, you have this sin in your life, so you're not going to have the healing. No, he, he healed the people that came to him that had all sorts of junk. So that is not a, a sign of whether God will heal you or not. Okay. Um, God is just as capable of healing in a quiet and private manner as he is in an open public meeting with lots of attention given to the people involved. So don't get caught up in the Christian showbiz. <laughs> um. And like I said, many times miracles do happen, but we have to test everything. Okay? Matthew 7, 21 first to, or to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter my kingdom, or enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So quite obviously, a miracle is not necessarily from God. Just because someone says they're performing a miracle in Jesus' name. Our greatest safeguard is found in the Lord's Prayer. Father, thy will be done. Here at The Remnant, we seek Jesus first. We seek the kingdom of God first. And then signs and wonders will follow. Sean says that all the time. <laughs> um, the next one I'm going to talk about is false prophecy and words of knowledge. We should never accept a word of knowledge or prophecy without seeking confirmation from the Lord as to its true source and searching the scriptures to see if it is in agreement with God's word. 1 Corinthians verse 14 or chapter 14, verse 29 says, Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. This verse shows us that the prophets are to be judged or tested. Here are some keys that can help us recognize demonic words of knowledge and prophecy. The first one is the Holy Spirit never glorifies a human. That's the same with the healing thing. Number two, never does the Holy Spirit lay guilt on a Christian for some sin which has already been confessed or forgiven. Yes. Demons do both frequently. Yeah. <laughs> Demons frequently try to establish their credibility by telling someone incidents from their past. This is number three, by the way. Um, so they'll tell someone something from their past um, which no one else in the room would know. Demons know everything that has happened in our lives. <laughs> That's, that's familiar spirits. Remember, we talk, talked about those. And they've had a lot of years to study human behavior. <laughs> so they can pretty well guess what's going on in someone's mind most of the time. Um, remember, the Holy Spirit never shows off. He always draws attention to Jesus. A recounting of past incidents or feelings in a person's life is a very common trait of demons, and that is what mediums and psychics do, okay? It's witchcraft. 
The Holy Spirit always gives you time. This is really key. This is number four. The Holy Spirit always gives you time to check out any directions he gives you. Demons push you to act in a hurry before you have time to check the directions with God's word. The Holy Spirit is never in a rush. That's why he says to test the spirits. The, 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 God says, test me in this, right? We're to test the spirits. And the Lord wants to speak to us individually. The frequent seeking of a word from the Lord through another person is evidence of poverty in a person's own relationship yeah. with the Lord. Yeah. We must develop a close relationship with the Lord so that we can hear him speaking with us directly. This is possible. Yeah. We're in serious trouble if we only rely on what other humans tell us what God wants. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next one is false slaying in the spirit. <laughs> slaying in the spirit. <laughs> it's a lot of information. <laughs> Slaying in the spirit is a common term used by many charismatic churches. The practice is that people go forward and someone lays hands on them for prayer. During the prayer, they lose consciousness either completely or partially to the extent that they fall onto the floor. The teaching is that they come under the power of the Holy Spirit to such an event that they become unaware of their surroundings or of their physical body. Here are two reasons why this practice can be very dangerous. First of all, there's no scripture in the Bible telling us that the Holy Spirit is going to knock us unconscious. Right. Nothing. I have never, ever seen that. Yeah. Um, there are scriptures, however, that tell us to control our minds. Yeah. To be alert. To be vigilant. If you accept a state of unconsciousness from any source without first testing the Spirit, then you can directly open up yourself to the entrance of demons. Falling into a state of unconsciousness is a common practice in occultic rituals and Eastern religions. This practice can be very hazardous, especially if you have been involved in the occult in the past. People have been involved in the occult, they come out, they get saved, suddenly they're involved in a church that practices these things, and the next thing you know, they're infiltrated with demons once again because of a supposed Christian practice, okay? I, I wanna be clear with all these things that I just mentioned. I'm not saying that laying, on, laying of hands on people to pray is bad. I'm not saying speaking in tongues is bad. We believe in all those things, okay? I'm just saying test the spirits. It's a warning, test the spirits. You never wanna allow something on a Holy Spirit come on you because of one of these areas, okay? Again, Satan is a copycat. He copies everything, okay? So you have to be careful what's actually of the Lord and what is not, okay? So we are officially done all of the witchcraft and new age stuff. Yay! <laughs> that took a really long time to get through. <laughs> um, we are now moving on to number three of the major doorways. <laughs> I feel like this is like two and a half weeks and we're only on number three. But anyway, these ones are a little bit quicker, so <laughs> they aren't as in detail. Um, but this doorway is inherited or generational doorways. Um, this is a very often overlooked doorway. Demons and demonic bondage are inherited. There are many references in the Old Testament to the sins of the fathers being passed down to the sons. In Exodus 34, verse 6 to 7, it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And this is mentioned in Exodus 34, verse 6 to 7, Numbers 14, 18, Deuteronomy 5, 9. It's mentioned various times that the sins of the fathers, the iniquities of the fathers, pass on to the children and the children's children to the fourth generations. I looked them all up and they all literally say the exact same thing. <laughs> so clearly, God wanted to make a very clear point of that to his people. Um, and any time there was a major revival in Israel, the people came together in fasting and prayer. And not only did they co confess their own sins, they would confess for the, sin, uh, the sins of their um, fathers or their ancestors. Yeah, yeah. Examples of this can be found in Nehemiah 
9, verse 1 to 2, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 1 to 11, 2 Chronicles 34, 19 to 21, and many others. So there's multiple verses that talk about that as well. The sins of our fathers do have a grave effect on us. Specific abilities and demons, demons can be passed from one generation to the next. If any of your ancestors had any involvement in witchcraft or the occult, idol worship, which is really demon worship, any demonic infestation, any oaths that which are binding upon the descendants, such as uh, um, the occult, pagan, Mormon, or Masonic oaths, um, or even addictions such as pornography, substance abuse, alcoholism, um, even things such as fits of rage or impatience or anger, those all can be inherited. And this is why we so often hear people say, oh, you're just like your mom or dad. <laughs> um, and in some cases that can be good, but in some cases it's not good. <laughs> so these doors ways must be closed by prayer, confession, and the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Any sin not brought under Christ's blood by us is legal ground for Satan. And we have seen many cases of inherited generational demons or curses passed on to other people. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I was actually just learning about this. And um, a friend of ours um, had a parent that passed away. And this parent had mental illness. And the friend of ours that he, he never had any symptoms ever of any mental illness ever in his life. The moment his parent passed away, suddenly he had started having these symptoms. And this is an example of literally the demon passed on to him as soon as his parent died. So this is very real and very possible. And, and the reason that this happens is the demon, demons look for bodies to go into. They need a body. And so the parent's dead. Well, what's the best next option? The child. And that's through inherited doorways. Um, and this is why it's so important to break generational inherited curses, and we'll go through how to do that next week. Pride, the number four, this is the next doorway, pride. Yeah, it's a big one. Dictionary defines it as this, a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. In other words, pride is thinking of ourselves higher than we should. And here's the thing, we can still have self-esteem issues and still have pride. So just because someone has low self-esteem doesn't mean that they, they don't have that pride, they don't have pride. Pride is the very root of our sin nature. Satan had that problem too and got kicked out of heaven for it. That's like basically the first sin, <laughs> really. Um, Jesus set such an example of humility for us. So if we're going to serve him, we must follow it. When we become servants of Jesus, we quickly recognize the fact that we are nothing. We're nothing without him. We're just sinners saved by grace. We have no power of our own. Neither do we control the power of our master. In Isaiah 42, verse 8, it says, God, God says he will not give his glory to anyone else. Right. And there are many scriptures talking about pride. Proverbs 8, verse 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Yes. Proverbs 11, verse 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Yes. But with humility comes wisdom. Yes. Proverbs 16, verse 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And pride is something we all have to deal with, all of us. Every single person has to deal with this doorway. Um, and even once we've dealt with it, it's something that we continuously need to keep in check because it so easily <laughs> sneaks up on us. And this is why the Bible tells us to test ourselves regularly. Yeah. 
We don't just test others, we test ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hatred and unforgiveness. This is the next one. I talked a little bit about this. Like I said before, hatred hatred is a conscious sin and it gives Satan legal ground in your life if you permit it to dwell, to dwell in your heart. Um like I said before, if you hate someone, Satan can step in and use your spirit body to attack the person you hate, right? Yeah. Um Hatred and unforgiveness is one of the top ways we can have an open doorway to Satan. Yeah. And again, this is why the Lord gives us so many commands to forgive one another. I know this is a little bit repetitive, but I believe repetition is actually very good. <laughs> it gets into our, you know, harder to forget. <laughs> um, if we can't forgive, how can the Lord Jesus forgive our sins? And there are many verses that talk about this. We must be careful to ask Jesus to cleanse and keep us pure. And this is why I think it's so important to daily pray Psalms 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and create a right spirit within me. Number six, rebellion. Rebellion is an act of defiance or resistance to authority. Rebellion is a sin. God will not tolerate rebellion in his servants. Every time you rebel against God, you are actively participating in witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubborn, stubborn, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. That's serious. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. He was talking to Saul. That's exactly the very... Some things that did happen to Saul, mm -hmm. and that it being the witch of Andor, God had to rebuke the literal, just not the sense yeah. out of him. Yeah. And for he was also angry with David. Yeah. Yeah, Saul participated in witchcraft through rebellion. Amen. First Samuel 12, verse 14 to 15 says, now if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, and if you do not rebel against the Lord's commands, then both you and your king will show that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commands and refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. Isaiah verse 63 verse 10 says, but they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit so he became their enemy and fought them. <clears throat> Hebrews 3, verse 15. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Right. Rebellion grieves the Holy Spirit. Rebell rebellion hardens your heart. Mm. This doorway must be closed if you want to have true freedom in Christ. Okay, so I'm closing up now. Um, we still have a few doorways to go through next week. I actually thought I could get through them all this week, and then I realized I had like 80-something pages, <laughs> which is like double the amount I had last week. So I had to cut it in half. But um, yes, we're going to finish the month off next week. Um, and we're going to go through how to close those doorways. And I also want to talk to you about how to know if you have an open doorway. What are the signs? I want to talk to you also about the deliverance of children. Um, and then either next week or the week after, again, it depends how quick we can go through this, but um, we'll talk about how to keep those doorways closed, okay? And a few other things. How to stand in the gap for someone, how to fight for someone who is demonically bound, that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm done. Have a great week. Bless you all. Woo!